Hi, I'm Hull History Nerd, and in this episode we're going to take a look at a structure that once stood right over the city, dominating the skyline to the east for hundreds of years, but which has been gone for over a century and a half. We're going to be taking a look at the history of Hull Castle and the citadel that it later evolved into. So the town of Hull in the early 16th century was a town that was going through some changes. The textile trade, which it had dominated for most of the 15th century, was starting to slacken off. And in its place was rising other trades, such as the trade in shipping lead that had been mined in England. There were ongoing legal disputes with the town. The town of Hull, for instance, had recently redrawn its borders and there were some disagreement between the uh, Priory at Holton Price and the city of Hull as to where the boundary of Hull began and where the boundary of Holton Price ended. All of this led to a rather epic punch-up between a bunch of people from Hull and a bunch of monks down at the Priory. Normally such disputes would be mediated by senior church figures such as the abbot at Muse, but these things were all about to change because the King of England, Henry VIII, you might have heard of him, was about to do something quite spectacular. Bad or good depends entirely upon your perspective. But needless to say, it would transform the shape of England forever. His Queen, the Spanish Catherine of Aragon, was having a terrible time actually producing children. She tragically only had one child that lived beyond infanthood, and that was Mary, a girl. And of course, as was the habit in those days, if it wasn't a boy, it wasn't an heir. Naturally, Queen Mary and later Queen Elizabeth I would change that attitude. But at the time, Henry was desperate for a male heir. And so desperate, apparently, that he had an affair with one of his wife's maids, Mary Boleyn, and then started to woo her sister, Anne. And Anne apparently was having none of it, unless she could marry him. Which led, of course, to a bit of a problem. The Catholic Church wasn't keen on divorce. Naturally, Henry was so excited by this attention from Anne that he decided to just divorce Catherine and be done with it. Only, it wasn't that simple. At this point, Catholicism was the main form of Christianity, and whilst protest movements like those surrounding Martin Luther were sweeping across some parts of Europe, the religion of power was very much still Catholic. And as I just said, Catholicism looked down on divorce. But to add to this, Catherine was also related to some very powerful figures in Catholic Europe, namely her nephew, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. The Pope said no, and in response, Henry decided he'd ditch Catholicism and build his own church, with Puritanism and divorces. This was widely regarded as a bad move and made a lot of people very angry. Specifically, most of Catholic Europe, including Emperor Charles V, were infuriated by this rejection of the default faith. But perhaps even worse, he also annoyed a huge number of English and Scottish Catholics with his insistence that everyone renounce Catholicism and accept the new Protestant Church of England with him at its head. Let's just bear in mind for a second that it was only around a couple of centuries earlier that the Cathars, a group of South Europeans who had their own non-Catholic brand of Christianity, were branded heretics and utterly wiped out by the church in what became known as the Albigensian Crusade. Deviation from Catholic doctrine was not tolerated. 
Worse, he not only rejected Catholicism, but he confiscated the land, buildings and treasure of the church across the country. He pulled down monasteries and churches and used the rubble in his new building projects. In one fell swoop, he ended the constant tug of war of power between the crown and the church by crushing the church and becoming the head of the new one. This reformation would be something of a powder keg for Henry over the coming years. This was a precarious time for Henry. Not only was England surrounded on all sides by belligerent Catholic nations, deeply unhappy at him separating from the church in Rome, but he'd alienated some of his key barons as well. Now, his answer to this in the short term was to protect the country, and he started building a series of castles around the coast. Now, the castle, probably not the right word to use here, perhaps something more accurate would be gunfort, because your old traditional medieval style castles with the big straight curtain walls and the square keeps were rendered largely useless by an invention in weaponry that had come along in the last 150 years, namely gunpowder. Gunpowder allowed you to construct cannons which could hurl a ball of lead the size of a fist at the castle walls, cracking the stone, breaking the mortar and eventually wearing them down. The days of hiding in a castle for months during a siege were over, but these castles were very, very different. And to understand why these castles were different, we perhaps need to look more deeply at what cannons are and just why they were so dangerous to conventional castles in the first place. On the whole, the idea of throwing a ball of lead at a wall doesn't seem particularly scary. After all, medieval siege weapons threw much larger rocks beforehand. But the problem is it's not just the size and weight of the thing you're throwing. That's only half the story. The speed that you throw it at massively increases the force with which the projectile will hit. And this isn't just some old and out of date technology that we're talking about here. Kinetic weaponry is probably potentially the most destructive force that humanity has so far harnessed. And you might be thinking of that with some doubt, bearing in mind we also have nuclear weapons, but stay with me. Even today, the A-10 Warthog plane built by the US is a plane that is constructed around a cannon that fires bullets heavy bullets that are around a foot long and accelerates them to almost three times the speed of sound. When a volley of these bullets hits even the sturdiest armoured tank, the tank loses. Spectacularly. Likewise, the US Navy has poured millions into developing railguns as a weapon. Railguns are simply a way of using a super powerful magnet to accelerate a chunk of metal to hypersonic speeds, and that means up to Mark 6 or 7 as an alternative to traditional artillery and missiles. And just in case you thought I was exaggerating when I said that kinetic weapons were potentially the most destructive force that we've weaponized, nature has already given us some examples of the raw destructive potential of this power. Celestial cannonballs, meteorites and asteroids. Huge balls of rock, ice and metal hurtling through space at speeds measured not in miles per hour, but miles per second. 66 million years ago, one of these smashed into the Gulf of Mexico and wiped out three quarters of all species of life on Earth, plunging the world into a decades-long nuclear winter and triggering earthquakes and volcanic events across the entire world, including the Deccan Traps in India, which contributed to the gas and dust that was blocking the sun. Nuclear weapons are civilization enders, but kinetic weapons can quite literally be planet killers. All of which is very sobering and depressing, but let's get back to the castles. It was noted at the time in the Middle Ages that the worst damage from cannon shot came when a straight wall was hit square on. The ball would stop dead, transferring its kinetic energy to the wall, which would then take more damage. It was also noted that round towers didn't always suffer quite as badly from cannon shots, mainly because the shot was more likely to hit at a slightly glancing angle and bounce off, taking a good chunk of that kinetic energy with it. A new breed of fortress was designed to withstand cannon fire, and it learned from these observations and built on them with curved walls and sharp angles and enormously thick walls. 
They were low squat buildings, designed as such so that cannons fired from ships would have less of a target to hit than the old, tall medieval castles. A really good example of one of these Tudor gun forts that still stands is Deal Castle in Kent, which was actually built after Hull Castle was commissioned, which demonstrates this new design aesthetic perfectly. So why build a castle all the way up the coast in Hull? Well, the answer to that one comes through a Catholic rebellion that erupted in the north of England, some of which was centred around the East Riding of Yorkshire and Sir Robert Constable of Flamborough. This rebellion was called the Pilgrimage of Grace. The Pilgrimage of Grace was effectively a northern Catholic rebellion, led by a group of nobles. It wandered around the north of England, occupying various towns and cities, sometimes with those towns' permission and other times with a little more force. And Henry was in a bad position when it came to stopping this, because if he came down too hard on the rebellion, he would alienate all of these barons who were already annoyed with him for turning his back on Catholicism in the first place. It would make him look as if he was persecuting the Catholics. So he had to tread lightly. So when he did finally come up to try and stop this pilgrimage from happening, he rounded them up and he pardoned them. And this won him some brownie points among some of those Catholic barons. Clearly, the king isn't deliberately persecuting Catholics. He wants to give them a second chance. Of course, the rebellion was undaunted. The pilgrimage of grace set off once again and carried on doing what it did. And again, Henry still didn't want to push his luck. So he got them together, wagged a stern finger at them, told them not to do it again and pardoned them. Now, this second pardoning really won the fence sitters, the barons over to his side. No king could possibly be expected to pardon people who were in open rebellion against the crown more than twice. So the next time the pilgrimage of grace reared its head, Henry stomped it flat, dragged the ringleaders to court and had them hanged in chains over the gates of York and Hull. And this was a particularly horrific style of execution. They were basically locked in a small cage and then hoisted up above the castle gates or the town gates where you would effectively die of dehydration or hunger, whichever came first, depending on whether people were taking pity on you and giving you water. And he did all this with the loyal support of all of his barons. His gamble paid off. When Henry came up to Hull in 1534 to have a look at the town that had been harbouring the rebellion, he was shocked at how poorly defended the port was. After all, the harbour of Hull was its entire purpose for existing, its raison d'etre if you want to be all French about it. And it was, apart from the town walls which circled three sides, on the river side of it, it had no defences at all, apart from a small round tower built during the time of Edward III. This was not to be tolerated. He saw an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone here. One, to protect the town from invasion, and two, to remind the people of Hull of the long arm of the king. So he built this castle that spanned the entire east side of the river Hull, as far as the city was concerned. The north blockhouse at one end, the south blockhouse at the other, a wall strung between them and in the middle, a keep. All of those buildings filled with cannons and gunpowder. The wall having spots along it where cannons could be placed. And a lobe of each of the blockhouses and the tower itself pointing back at the city of Hull a stark reminder that at any time the king could order the city to be levelled with cannon fire. So just to put some perspective on this and to give you some context as to where the castle would have been in the real world as we live in it today, the North Blockhouse would actually have been right behind me here at this junction between Great Union Street and Witham, just near North Bridge. In fact, that 
is another thing that Henry VIII and his castle changed in the landscape of Hull, because before he built the castle, there was no such thing as a bridge over the river at the city. In fact, there was a North Ferry, but North Bridge was the very first bridge here, and I did a whole episode on that, which I'll link up in the corner here or down in the description below, so that you can check out the history of that if you want to. Now, this would have been quite a spectacularly big building, it would have filled this entire junction side to side and overlapped onto the buildings that you see across the road behind me. And the North Blockhouse sadly proved to be the poor relation of the three big buildings of the castle. Because it was so far up the river, I guess, it was seen as being not as vital as the other two for the defense of the city. In fact, it was only a few decades after its construction that the threat of invasion from the continent started to subside, and instead the North Block House was being used as a prison for unrepentant Catholics. This period of Henry's distrust soon passed, and within a few years the garrison was being crewed by locals. As we've just seen, the North Block House stood where the end of Great Union Street is today, and the wall that connected it to the rest of the castle ran along exactly the same route as Great Union Street, right up to the junction with Clarence Street today. And then it headed southeast towards the central keep, which would have been located somewhere along Tower Road, though a little further to the east than the modern street. The South Block House, the very end point of the castle itself, stood close to where the deep is now, which back then would actually have been on the point where the Hull and the Humber meet. There's been a lot of land reclamation during the frenzy of dock building in the 19th century in that area, so there has been more land added, hence why it's not quite on the shore anymore. But in the end, Britain didn't get invaded by the French, the Spanish or the Holy Roman Empire, and so the fear that had sparked the construction of the castle diminished somewhat. Garrisons were reduced, the North Blockhouse was used to house religious prisoners, and occasionally there were flurries of activity when tensions flared up with Spain, but the first century of the castle's life were fairly uneventful. The castle became simply a place where huge amounts of munitions were sold for the crown, a magazine, and it became one of the largest magazines in the north of England. Fast forward a little, and in the 1640s, tensions were growing between King Charles I that's the king who looked like a spaniel, and Parliament, mainly because he attempted to kidnap five MPs, and Sir Charles fled north and started touring the country to secure these magazines for his use. It was on a fateful day in 1642 that he visited Hull on such a mission. The parliamentarians of Hull were ready for him, and Sir John Hotham, himself actually a royalist but very firmly outnumbered by the parliamentarians, had the unenviable task of standing atop the Beverly Gate and telling his king that he couldn't come in. Charles didn't take this well, and after going away to a local farmhouse to have some tea, laid brief siege to Hull. This ended poorly for him. Hull's ditches surrounding the town walls had sluice gates at both ends, and they were both opened, flooding the land around and turning Hull into an unassailable island. Because of this magazine, Hull Castle was one of the flashpoints for the English Civil War, which, in case you hadn't gathered already, wasn't particularly civil at all. When the restoration of the monarchy happened in the 1660s, King Charles II went and took stock of all of the fortifications throughout the country, with particular interest to the powder magazines. And when it came to Hull, well, it wasn't looking good after the Civil War. The South Blockhouse was in poor repair, the moat around it had started to silt up, the keep wasn't much better, and the North Blockhouse was in a largely ruined condition. We still had guns, but it was largely in a ruined condition. The decision was made by Charles to consolidate the South Blockhouse and the keep and enclose them as part of a larger citadel a walled, triangular-shaped fortress that would make use of the gun battery, the, the prodigiously powerful gun battery of the South Blockhouse by having it protrude through the walls and be part of the main defences. The North Blockhouse, which as I said earlier was always the poor relation, 
was sadly left to uh, basically fall apart and die, which was helped along by in 1691, part of it being blown up by accident as some munitions that were being transported went off. The damage was repaired, but it really wasn't used very much. And by 1801, it was sold and demolished. which left the citadel, which its top corner would have been around here, where the castle was, the keep. And it must have been quite the sight with the angled walls just sweeping across and all the way down with a big moat dug around the whole thing. And the citadel served for many, many years as a magazine and an armory. The keep itself was turned into an armory and the South Blockhouse just did what it always did, worked as a powder magazine and a cannon battery. But as time rolled on, newer and better forts were actually built. And whilst the whole thing did have a, a massive renovation at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, and particularly in the early 1800s, it couldn't hide the fact that this was very long in the tooth at that point. And newer forts that were built in the 1860s, such as the one at Paul, just a little bit further down the Humber coast, started to take over the duties that the citadel had once maintained, defence of the Humber. And it suffered the indignity during the 1850s of being dug around in the construction of Victoria Dock, leaving it isolated on a kind of spur of land right at the meeting of the Hull and the Humber. And it wasn't long after the construction that it was sold, finally closed off, no longer part of the Crown possessions, no longer part of Britain's defences, just a decaying, crumbling ruin that was standing in the way of some good dock warehouses. The whole thing was demolished in the 1860s. So I suppose the big question you're probably asking is, is there anything left? Anything that you can look at and definitely say this was part of the citadel? And the answer is, uh, not really, not much. I mean, there's the fossilised shape of Great Union Street, which, as I said earlier, followed the line of the curtain wall from the North Blockhouse. And then there's a reconstructed part of the corner of the citadel on the Victoria Dock housing estate, where they've mounted the last surviving piece of its architecture, the little turret on the top of it. That turret spent many, many years living in East Park in the rocks, where it was used as a, an unofficial urinal by generations of small boys. Yeah, it's in a better place now, trust me. But every so often you kind of see things that echo it, and every so often there's things where architects have paid homage to it. Like here, for instance, the base of this industrial unit here, the wall, is actually modelled on the shape of the citadel's walls. And it, it wasn't until I was actually filming down here that I actually noticed that and was like, oh yeah. And it's nice when you see that kind of love of the history kind of, because you know, the architects didn't have to do that. They could have just built a nice plain unit like this. But that I think is a lovely memorial to what used to stand just a little bit further back on this very spot. Now on the surface, there's nothing to see. But under the ground, most of the foundations still remain. And I was lucky enough to be filming this whilst an archaeological dig was happening on the South Blockhouse, a very big archaeological dig. And I went down to have a word with some of the archaeologists and take a poke around. When the South Blockhouse was demolished in the 1860s, the floor levels were so substantial that the Victorians decided that dismantling them was far too much work and effort, and instead used them as a solid foundation to build on. During the excavation, the archaeology team found evidence of Victorian warehouse footings built directly onto the remains of the blockhouse itself. The section of the building that's been excavated can be seen here and contains part of two of the large petal shaped lobes and the gatehouse at the rear that would originally have been next to the curtain wall. Here they found many things that tell us of life on the dockside with things like clay pipes, 
and life in the Citadel, finds that even included a cannonball. I had a chat to Peter Connolly, the archaeologist in charge of the dig, to find out more. So obviously a dig like this is going to be quite a complicated one because it's a big building and, and, yeah. and what I see in archaeology normally they put a little trench in and then kind of go ah yes we can go to town on this tiny bit but on a dig this size it must actually be quite overwhelming and a bit intimidating. It's a massive challenge <laughs> as you could have expect. I mean, the, the trench is about 50% the size of the building itself so you come to really realise how big the South Block House was. It's huge. Yeah, that's um, one thing that's no I've noticed is the sheer scale of yeah. it. I mean, it's one thing to see the map and, and to see the, um, the, the the drawings in the whole history centre, but to actually stand here on the surface, you think, wow, this is this is a proper castle, isn't it? Yeah, it's a fortification. Yeah, it's a, it's a small fort. Um, and it's also a building that was used for 350 years. Mm. So like any building, it, you've got to pick your way back through time to understand how those 350 years changed and adapted the building itself before you could pick your way back to the, Ju the Tudor period. Yeah. So, it's I mean, I, you were telling me just a few minutes ago, this floor that we're standing on was actually put in at the start of the 19th century. So it's, this is a Georgian floor. Yeah, it is. Well, that's as far as we understand it at the moment. So at the beginning of the 19th century, there's been adaptations and changes around the Citadel across the, the you know the first hundred and plus years of the citadel itself um, and this south box basically gets turned to an armory store so a naval store right so what we think that is going on is that throughout its life they have had to deal with water we're not far from the estuary we're not far from the river there's also a big moat around it as well yeah water has always been a problem we live in hell what yeah. is the problem floods and, um, and water ingress is the problem so if you think of it as a naval armoury store and you've got armories in here and you've got powder in here, you want to keep your powder dry. That's a very good point, yeah. Yeah, so if you're, you, we know that there's big drains cutting through the building, they're always trying to make sure that any of the water that's coming up is flowing away, mm. so they bring up the floor. They basically so raise, build over the water. Yeah, raise the floor by a good 70 centimetres. Okay. And then they re floor it. We think what they do is also take out the first floor and roof over or re-roof the roof of the building as well. Of course, because of course, if you bring up the floor, the ceiling is going to be you'd be, yeah, you'd be walking yeah, around yeah, it like yeah, that, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so it was a it major means, renovation. Then. It's a major renovation. Yeah. Wow. And of course, what they do is waste not, want not, make sure that you use as many Tudor bricks or um, later bricks as you can get your hands on. So when you look at this floor surface, you think it's quite good. But actually, when you start to look at it. Every brick has been reused. It's all slightly chipped and broken. Oh, um, and it's all slightly higgledy piggledy. Yeah. There's like rows of, of the same size brick, but then there's another row of a different size brick, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, it's like a big kind of jigsaw puzzle where you've just kind of taken some scissors and cut the bits off and then just jammed it all together anyway. You've hit the nail on the head. Basically, the process of doing archaeology in a building is like this. It's a bit like taking a jigsaw, and but when you do a jigsaw, you follow the cover. Yeah. And it, gives you, it lets you know what you're building. So take the cover, throw it away, so you have no idea what the picture is going to be. Yeah. <laughs> take a handful of those jigsaw pieces and throw them away because you're never going to have all the pieces. Set yourself a challenge, maybe take a corner away in some of the edges so you're not quite sure where to start and then put the picture back together. That's archaeology. That's archaeology, <laughs> yeah. So amazingly, you look at this behind us, yes. and what we're looking at is the thickness of the Tudor wall of the South Blockhouse. So we were in, we are basically in the guard room area. Right, okay, so okay. we're on the inside, and that yeah. whole that whole width there is, is the wall. Yeah, so from this front face to the back face, that is the width of the this side of the guard room wall. Wow. In that, we have got a Tudor gun emplacement, um, with side chambers off of it. We think that was basically going on. If you had a gun in there, um, you want to make sure that your heavy cannonballs, you're not having to bend down to ah, pick yeah, them so up. You've got so they're the, at, yeah. at waist height to bring them in, load, bring other things, load, and you can do all that so you're not having to hurt your back. Really good ergonomics. Oh, so yeah. Really well thought Health out. and safety in yeah, the 17th yeah. century. So you've got, you've got this position here, and then you have... Um, 
a, a fireplace that you can no longer see. So it's 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 beautiful herringbone patterned Tudor oh, fireplace. Is that that one we can see just just, just slightly over the top there, the herringbone the pattern? Yeah. Um, right. And probably okay. a bread oven beside it, again making use of heat. But ah, at some yeah, point, yeah, light the fire and then you use that. Those to cook. two are divided away with a wall. We know that the fireplace is still in use, but the oven side yeah. isn't because we've got sooting on one side of the bricks and not on the other right, side. Okay. And then later on, the gun chamber there, which was probably toward the end of its life, used as a coal store, is blanked out. They oven space is blanked out and the fireplace is blanked out so entirely so that 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 is that what i can see here then where yeah. you've got these different bricks yeah. kind of gumming up those little yeah, yeah. bricks right. and reused stone so within that bit of wall we've got one two three different phases of build so, I mean, so this, this is basically a bit like when you buy a house and you can see that there's, a, there's like a line of bricks where a window clearly used to be a door yeah but so, if you think that yeah. like when you, if you're buying a house and that that window which is a window now might have been a door but that door itself might have been bigger and they've made it smaller um, so there's multiple so it, stages so of that multiple yeah. stages so and we've got a little bit of the tudor floor surviving there's a little oh, stub wow. of brick floor surviving down the very bottom that's the tudor but, surface right the way down at the bottom right the bottom yeah that's a big difference in height isn't it yeah yeah and then just to confuse matters but so that everybody understands this big salt glazed drain is late Victorian, early Edwardian. Right, yeah. I didn't think that that looked like Tudor. No, but <laughs> we treat it like archaeology. Because it, it is. It is, yeah. Um, it's the archaeology of our modern city's utilities. And, and of course, city's yeah, utilities. It's, it's that whole thing of, of, I mean, this is buried under the ground. And I mean, one of the things that shocked me when I was sort of learning about Hull's archaeology is just how little leeway we have like some places like york you've got six to seven meters of archaeology in hull we have a couple of meters tops yeah so they've just sliced through i mean like the, you can see some of the, f when you look at it from from the back there the big lines that have just been gouged through it as people have put water yep. mains and sewage yep. and gas mains yep. through right yep. through the archaeology yep. yeah so this is literally part of that archaeology yeah it's the archaeology utilities well how we get to being a modern city yeah you know, that like um the putting in of drains and fresh water all of that work that comes after basil j and his um drains of london and his sewers of london you know it happens here as well so yeah. they cut so the big scar that cuts right through the middle is late 19th early 20th century so these right. people are just like have just driven a huge drain right through this part here because yeah, i mean of course at this time this is just underground this is nothing more than just a building that got knocked down that nobody yeah. cares about yeah. anymore yeah so like in the 1860s by the mid 1860s it's gone entirely yeah they just bit of, miraculously and you know thank the heavens for us they've dropped it to ground floor level and then just filled in over it and so then, thankfully they've not grubbed out the ground floor yeah they've just dropped it to ground so floor. The, which is lovely because we actually have we can walk around on this yeah. floor which is the the, ninth, the early 19th century floor yeah. as you say this lovely higgledy piggledy uh, brick mosaic and, and, I know and it, what we it's say incredible it gives you an idea century. of the shape and the size of it as yeah. well we say early 19th century just like it was yesterday but this is still 200 years old absolutely you know, nearly 210 <laughs> yeah. 220 years old that's so incredible isn't that's it? that's incredible and then we can look at it you know we could be looking at things that have happened in the 18th century and then we're looking back at the original build which dates back to the 1540s so when you're looking at that space there and the thickness of the walls you're looking back to something that was built 480 years ago yeah. so the people that would have built this the brick kilns out here the brick clay pits out here were living at the same time as henry the and then i always sort of like think think of the, the poor people at dry pool parish <laughs> just they had this gigantic wall erected you know, right in got, front of the, the village out there you've got this little parish you know village style sitting on the edge of the city and then suddenly you know, every morning or every day you have to look up and you've got this big wall. Of course, I mean, just it, it just, down it, it, they used to be right on the riverside and of course this would have just cut it off from the river yeah. entirely, wouldn't it yeah. really? Yeah, what you're seeing, and you know, this is I think in many ways the point, is that it's a complex building, the physical changes and, and differences that we see within it are particularly complex, the different types of brick, 
the different types of stone, the reuse of masonry, the artifacts that come out oh, of it. Yeah, I mean, that's something I noticed. Um, when I was looking around, there was some kind of, like, looked like carved medieval stonework. Yeah, you're right, you're right, it is carved. And it just didn't seem like something from a Tudor war machine. What they're doing is they are reusing the monastic masonry that has been coming out of abbeys such as Mews Abbey. Right. That's been like, so you get the, the dissolution of the lesser monasteries yeah. and that material is being recycled. So when we know that there's a, a demolition team setting up at Mews Abbey yeah. and that there are boats bringing rubble down the river, it's wow. not to say that the material here all exclusively comes from there. No, because there got, would have been a few other yeah, monastic exactly. buildings inside the city yeah. as well. well. Yeah, We've got part of a medieval spiral staircase, we've got parts of window mullions, we've got parts of window sills. Like these wouldn't have been used in the citadel though because they wouldn't have had a use for window mullions in a military building it looks like basically they're using them as hardcore packing wow so they're just grinding up the monasteries and just using them to fill the walls yeah yep. that's a hell of a message to send out to the yeah. catholics of yeah, britain yeah, isn't yeah. it yeah, really, this is yeah. what we think of your religion yeah. and your faith yeah. we're going to grind it down and just use it to stick between our walls we're not yep. even going to let yep. you see it we are taking apart this roman catholic church for a new world this building is part of that new world uh, and so a heavy that statement. is that statement in stone yeah. in destruction literally so, but that's, what, that's what you get from the doing the archaeology because obviously you can tell the story through the brilliant historic documentation yeah but partnering that history with the physical act of uncovering this monument archaeologically and looking at all the different phases and seeing phases that don't match entirely carefully to the historic documentation where it's a bit of a head scratcher we were yeah. thinking that it sheds new light, doesn't it? Like that. It's that period, so we're always getting yeah new light into this building. Absolutely, it kind of it challenges some of the established kind of normal what we assume to be the case, and it lets you look at it again and go, actually, it's a complex picture. Yeah, it's getting more complex all the time. Fantastic! Thank you so much for showing me around. It's Thank been you absolutely for brilliant. Along, to us. So there you have it: the history of Hull's Castle and its citadel. A Tudor fortress that was built originally because Hull rebelled against Henry VIII and which played a pivotal role in Hull's rebellion against Charles I. This fantastic building of which now nothing above the surface remains apart from memorials like this. And of course the shape of Great Union Street and names like Tower Street and Castle Street. But even though nothing exists above the surface of these buildings, we now know that underneath the surface, there's a whole world of riches from this period outlining the bases of these magnificent structures and preserved by the soil from the ravages of time. Long live the citadel. <laughs>